Hey everyone, in this video we're going to come back to the Hannibal story from Eutropius, book 3, and look at chapter 14 from his story on Hannibal. So again, at this point in the, the narrative of the Second Punic War, <clears throat> we've seen a bunch of different areas of fighting, um, things happening in Spain, we've seen things happening in Sardinia, Italy, Macedon, and the last thing we're really talking about is how the Romans were getting stretched in a couple of different areas as the Carthaginians had opened up. Um, a few new fronts of the war, including trying to get um, Sardinia right to rebel, which they did, and opening up this front with Macedon with King Philip. So at this point of the narrative, we're going to pick it up and we're going to come back to um, Italy and see what Hannibal has been doing and then continue to the story to see kind of where it's gone from there now that we've read that Philip was defeated um, you know, in Macedon, and that the Romans are doing pretty well in Spain. So this part of the, the story, chapter 14, picks up here. You have Decimo Anno, postquam Hannibal in Italium Venerat, Publius uh, Publio, rather, Sulpicio, Naio Folio, Consulibus, Hannibal Usque ad Quarta Miliarium, Urbis Acesit, Equites Eos Usque ad Portam. So it's a long sentence, but it's getting you a lot of timing, um, uh, words here, and it's kind of showing you're setting the stage of when things are happening. So it starts by saying decimo anno, which is ablative of time when, so in the 10th year. <clears throat> and it's in the 10th year after postquam Hannibal had come into Italy. So Winerat is pluperfect tense. So Eutropius starts by setting the stage there, right? He's trying to give you a sense of when these events are happening, and he's relating it back to Hannibal and Hannibal's arrival into Italy. But then he gives you another um, timing phrase here, right, with the ablative absolute. So he has um, Publius Sulpicius, right, uh, Sulpicio, it's ablative, and you have Consulibus, which is also ablative. So here, um, you know, this is a very common way of telling you the year by telling you who the consuls were. So he's saying with, you know, uh, Publius Sulpicius and Gnaeus Fulvius being consuls or when they were consuls. So again, he's setting the stage of when these things are happening. I always found this part of the story interesting because there's really not a need to, to put both, right? If you're saying it's in the 10th year after Hannibal had come to Italy, we already know basically what, what year it is, um, or we're getting a sense of the timing. So to follow that up with uh, saying who the consuls were and telling us again what the year is, is kind of an interesting choice. And I think it kind of highlights the idea that Hannibal has been in Italy for a very long time, right? And I think as you read Eutropius's narrative, you lose the fact that it's 10 years because he's been condensing so many events into short, um, short little chapters, right? At some point, you lose the sense of just how long the war has been going. So I appreciate that he does that here. But either way, it's saying that you have uh, two consuls, right? Fulvius and Sulpicius, and it's the 10th year after Hannibal has arrived. What does Hannibal do, right? So you have Hannibal. He, Akeset, <clears throat> he approached, right? Perfect tense. He approached up to the Quartum Miliarium, the fourth milestone urbis of the city. So he's very close, right? He's within four miles of the city. And it mentions how his equites, his cavalry, right, equites eos, the cavalry of him, literally his cavalry. Um, and you have to kind of imply the approaching again. So akaserat is kind of the, the implied verb here. But they approached up to the gate, right? So this is where you get that famous phrase of Hannibal at the gates, okay? So he's actually gotten within um, a few miles of the city of Rome, and he sent his cavalry up ahead to basically scare everyone um, as sort of a, a scouting party, and they can see that Hannibal is, is arriving, right? So he's very close to the city of Rome. Then you have mox consulum cum exercitu venientium metu Hannibal ad campaniam se recapit. So soon, though, right, you have uh, the subject here is Hannibal. So it's a little ways down the sentence. But Hannibal, he say recapit. He took himself back. Literally, he retreated ad campania. So he retreated to Campania, right? He went back south. Why did he do this? The ablative of cause is telling you why. So metu, because of fear, right? And it's fear of the venientium consulum, of the coming consuls or of the consuls coming cum exercitu with an army. OK, so it's saying that Hannibal goes up to the gates of Rome, but then because of fear, according to Eutropius, fear of this approaching army, he retreated back to Campania, right? He goes back south. So what Eutropius is mentioning here is a couple things, but he's really referencing indirectly, very indirectly, the siege of Capua, which is 211 BCE. So the idea here is that Hannibal is still kind of wreaking havoc, um, you know, in southern Italy. He's besieging this very, very important city, Capua, right, a main city. And uh, he's not able to break the siege, so he's trying to draw the Romans off by going after Rome. And he's hoping if I threaten Rome, maybe it'll force them to let go of Capua. Um, but it's this really interesting moment 
that a lot of you know historians reference. If you ever watch like a documentary or anything on the Second Punic War, people will mention why didn't Hannibal attack Rome? And uh, if you're in my class, uh, you know I always say it's sort of like moves on a chessboard, right? Why didn't he go for checkmate? Um, and the the logic or the way I've always heard it is the idea that he didn't have enough troops, right? To, to actually siege Rome. Um, there's there's Roman armies kind of about that could have attacked him. He's just not able to do it. But it's an interesting question of why he doesn't, um, you know, besiege Rome. And Eutropius is referencing that here by saying that the, the approaching army is what scares him off. But you can do a little research and kind of dive into it because it is an interesting question. And it ties back to what we saw earlier in Eutropius with what's going on in Spain. So the Scipios defeating Hasdrubal, right, the brother of, of Hannibal in Spain, forces the Carthaginians to make a decision right? Uh, to make a decision, rather. So you have Hannibal, who had sent all those rings after the Battle of um, Cannae, saying, hey, look how great I'm doing, right? Send me reinforcements. But then you have Hasdrubal, who's losing in, in Spain, and Spain is really a power source for the Carthaginians. So it leads to this interesting point where, um, you know, if you look at Eutropius's narrative, he's kind of connecting those two things and saying, by sending the reinforcements to Spain and not to Italy, it kind of, uh, you know, stalls Hannibal's plans. And you see that here with him going up to Rome, but not actually taking it. So now we can, and again, you should look at that um, siege of Capua on your own. It's a really interesting um, part of the story. And, and again, it'll give you a sense of what Eutropius is referencing here. But now we continue on. We actually uh, shift gears. So you got a little sense of what's going on in Italy. Now we're changing back to Spain. You have in Hispania, a fratre eos hasdrubale, Ambos Scipiones, <clears throat> qui per amultos anos victores fuerunt, interficiuntur, exercitus tamen, integermanse, casu enem magis erant quam virtute decepti. So the first part puts us in Spain, in Hispania, right? There's a lot going on here. But you have in Spain, and then you have this ablative of agent, <clears throat> a fratre eos hasdrubale, so by his brother, um, Hasdrubal. So the ablative of agent is implying that they did something, right? You're probably anticipating some sort of passive voice verb, but something happened uh, to someone and it was done by the uh, by the brother of Hannibal, right? Hasdrubal by his brother. And then we get the subject, ambo Scipiones, right? Both Scipios. So uh, we're already getting set up that something happened to the Scipios, right? And it was done by Hasdrubal. Remember, they've been fighting him in Spain. And then we have this relative clause started by qui. So it's both Scipios who, um, for many years, right, per multos anos, it's that accusative uh, duration of time, right? For many years, fuerant, they had been victorious. They had been victors, right? So they've been winning for many years. But now, here's our verb, interficiuntur, they're killed right? They were killed. So this is the verb that kind of sets up what you just saw in the beginning of this sentence. They were killed by his brother, meaning by Hannibal's brother, Hasdrubal. So the both Scipios, one of uh, whom is the father of the famous Scipio Africanus, they both die in Spain. So this is another sort of dramatic twist in the story. And um, Eutropius is showing you another obstacle that Romans are going to have to overcome. The Scipios are killed. However, Tamen, their army, the Exercitus, right, their army, Mansit Integer, it remained intact. Um, it doesn't mean that nobody died. They did lose a lot of troops. It means that their army didn't just scatter to the wind and get completely routed. They still had some semblance of an army. They just lost the two generals, right, the, the Scipios. Then you have this ablative of means by chance, Kasu, right? And it's saying for by chance, more than, so magis quam is setting up this comparative, uh, a comparison rather, and you have the ablative of means um, kind of expressing both of that. So you're saying it was by chance more than by virtue. And then erant is really connected to decepti here. It's a pluperfect passive verb. So you're saying they had been deceived, meaning both Scipios who died had been tricked. So it's saying that they got, they, they didn't die in battle, right? I mean, it wasn't battle. Let me rephrase. They didn't die because they were out generaled, if that makes sense. It's saying they were, they, they died more by a trick. They were deceived by chance or by, by a, by trickery from Hasdrubal more than by virtue. So this is an interesting line where Eutropius is sort of defending both the Scipios and uh, throwing some, um, I guess you could say throwing some shade on Hasdrubal, right? And call, calling him into question saying, yeah, you're not really a great general. You tricked us. And that's how you killed 
um, both Scipios. What he's referencing here is actually a couple battles, but it's usually referred to the Battle of the Upper Bytus, right? So there's two of them, uh, two battles back to back, and it's happening in this southern part of Spain. You can see on this um, map, just a Wikipedia map I pulled to give you the visual, but you can track the route of the Scipios and their campaign in Spain. When they get into that southern region, this is where they start to, to fight some more pitched battles against um, Hasdrubal. And this one, if I remember right, is the Romans had a bunch of uh, Spanish merc uh, mercenaries that they'd put in their army, and I believe Hasdrubal bribes them. And so the trick part that Eutropius is referencing is the Romans think they have mercenaries, and all of a sudden they switch sides and they disband and go to Hasdrubal, and they find themselves in, in trouble, right? And both the Scipios end up getting killed. That's the, the trickery he's referencing. But again, it's a really interesting um, battle or set of battles that you should look up, right? A quick search, and you'll find this, and you'll be able to read more about it. But in terms of the narrative, now we have things not going very well. So again, we have Hannibal outside Rome, right? He's at the gates. Um, he retreats, but he's threatening them. And now we have Hasdrubal uh, in Spain killing both Scipios. Spain had been an area that Eutropius has been telling us that was going well for the Romans. And now all of a sudden, hmm, not so much, right? Both the generals are dead. Then you continue, you have quo tempore etiam a consule Marcello Sicilia magna pars capta est, quam tenere afri coiperant et nobilissima herb Syracusana, prida ingens Romam perlata est. So again, we start with the ablative at that time, quo tempore, right? It's kind of connecting everything. Um, at that time, too, <clears throat> you have Magna Pars Siciliae, a great part of Sicily. And then we have this ablative of agent by the consul Marcellus, right? So something's happening to a great part of Sic uh, Sicily. Here's your passive verb, capta est. It was captured, right? It's perfect tense, passive voice. So a big part of Sicily was captured by the consul. So that's good, right? So at the same time, things are going badly in Spain. But in Sicily, right, another front of the war, things are going pretty well, right? And it's not just Sicily, but it's a great part of Sicily, which, quam, the Africans, again, remember Eutropius refers to the Carthaginians both as Carthaginians and sometimes just as Afri, Africans, right? Um, which the Africans had begun to hold, tenere coiperant, right? So it's saying that the Carthaginians had started to push into Sicily and the consul Marcellus pushes back and takes it for the Romans. And now he references a really um, famous city in a famous battle. But he says, and uh, nobilissima herb Syracusana. So literally, and the most noble city, Syracuse, right? The noblest city. And you have to imply capta est, right? The same verb that we just saw. It was captured, right? So in other words, it's saying he captured, Marcellus captured a great part of Sicily, and he captured this famous, famous city of Syracuse, Okay. And it says that a prida in games, a huge loot, perlata est, was carried back, you might say, it's perfect tense passive voice, was carried back to Rome. So not only does he capture Syracuse, but he's bringing a lot of um, like spoils, spoils of war back. So again, this is a, there's a lot of huge references Eutropius is making in this section. So this is one of them. It's the Siege of Syracuse, which is around 212, 213 BCE. Um, this uh, event is very famous, not necessarily because of the battle itself, but because of who's in it. And the person in it is Archimedes, right? The famous Greek mathematician. And so the stories are Archimedes is, is in Syracuse. Remember, Syracuse is a Greek city, um, so it has that longstanding Greek tradition. <clears throat> he was there and he plans the defense of the city. So if you want to believe the stories, there's things like death rays where they took a bunch of um, polished, I think it's polished bronze or brass mirrors, and they reflected sunlight and lit ships on fire. Um, there's stories about giant cranes that could be dropped and lift uh, ships out of the water to flip them. All these great things and you know, supposedly designed by Archimedes. And it's also where he dies. So this is something that I, I believe the Romans didn't want to do or mean to do, but the Roman soldiers do kill Archimedes. And uh, there's this great story of his, you know, he's drawing circles on the ground, doing a mathematic equation. And when the soldiers show up to kill him, the thing he says is don't disturb my circles, right? He's focused on his math and his work more so than the fact that they're about to kill him. So it's a famous, famous episode, one that you want to look into um, just because of how, how wild the story is of death rays and things like that. But the Siege of Syracuse is another famous battle, and it does lead to the death of one of these great um, minds of the ancient world, Archimedes. So you want to look into that. Again, Eutropius doesn't mention Archimedes, but he is part of that uh, part of that siege. Then we continue, and you have Lywinus in Macedonia cum Philippo et multis Graeciae populis et rege Asiae atelo amicitiam fecit. 
Okay, and this is part of a, a, a larger sentence, which is why I put the dot, dot, dot. <clears throat> so also you have Lyuenus, right? The guy who had gone to Macedon and had defeated Philip in Macedon, right? So he, you have to go all the way to the end. He fake it amikitiam. He made friendship, right? He made peace in Macedon, in Macedonia, with Philip, right? Cum Philippo, and with many peoples, multis populis, many peoples of Greece. So he, he, he goes in and you know, defeats Philip, and then he starts making basically peace treaties with all these people in Greece and in Macedon. Okay, and he makes one with uh, King Attalus of Asia, right? And by Asia, it's really talking about um, just skipping across the Mediterranean to like modern day Turkey is really uh, what it's talking about, Pergamum. Um, but it's talking about how he, he he's winning and he's making peace right after he defeats these people. Um, so things are going well in Sicily and things are going well in the area of Greece, right? Then you continue, you have et ad seciliam profectus hanonem quendam afrorum ducem apud agregentum civitatem cum ipso opido capit eunque romam cum captivis nobilissimis misse. So, and ad seciliam to Sicily profectus, having set out, meaning he, having set out, it's a perfect passive participle, having set out to Sicily, right? He, um, and you have to go a little ways down to capit, right? He captured um, Hanonem Quendam, a certain Hanno, right? Meaning this guy named Hanno, a Duke Amaforum, a leader of the Carthaginians or of the Africans, right? One of the generals, you might say. Where did he get him? At the city state or the city of Agrigentum, okay? So he captured Hanno and with the town itself, right? Um, meaning he not only captured Hanno, but he captured uh, you know the the town, right? He took uh, he took everything, and Misit he sent Aumque. Aum is him, meaning Hanno, right? He sent him back to Rome, Romam, cum captivis nobilissimis, with the most noble captives. So uh, Lyuinus, I think we're kind of playing around with the the timeline a little bit here. But Lyuinus makes an about face, right? After he kind of wins in Greece, he goes down to Sicily, right? And he's part of that. Um, that push into recapturing um, Sicily, and he takes the city of Agrigentum, right, which is a famous city. I believe it's the southwestern shore of Sicily. Um, but you can look it up. So things are going well, right? Lyuinus comes back into uh, into the fold in Sicily, and he's capturing the town, and he's capturing Hanno, um, and things are going pretty well again in Sicily for the Romans. <clears throat> then you have XL Quitates in Deditionem Acapit XXVI Expugnavit. Uh, ita omnis Sicilia recepta est in genti gloria Romam regressus est. So XL is 40. So you have Acapit, he accepted, meaning Lyuinus, he accepted 40 cities, right? XL Quitates. In deditiona means like in surrender, in kind of giving themselves up is one way to think of it, but in surrender. So he took the surrender of 40 cities, but he also had to expugnate. He had to destroy, right? He destroyed 26 of them. So 40 surrendered, the ones that didn't surrender, he destroys, expugnate, okay? And so, ita, thus, you might say, all of Sicily, right? Omnis Sicilia recapta est. It was received. It was taken back, right? It's a perfect passive verb. So he took back or recaptured all of Sicily. So it's talking about how things are going pretty well. And now they've taken back the entire island. Then you have regresso est. He returned, right? It's a deponent verb. He returned to Rome. How did he do it, right? We need that sort of ablative of manner here with great glory in Genti Gloria, right? So he went back to Rome after he took Sicily, um, with, with a lot of glory, right? Which makes a lot of sense, capturing the island. Again, this battle in Agrigentum, actually here it is, this is what I was thinking before, that southern part of Sicily, this is where they're referencing, again, another uh, battle you could look up. The attack or the conquest of Sicily is an important one. Feel free to look this up, but Agrigentum is a famous battle, again, in 210 BC that Eutropius is referencing. Feel free to pause a little bit and, and take a look back at what he's talking about. But you can see it's in Sicily, right, which is a major battleground of this war, and things are starting to turn around a little bit for the Romans even though, you know, in Spain, things are a little questionable. And in mainland Italy, you still have Hannibal kind of wreaking havoc. In other places, the war is going well. Then you have this line. You have Hannibal in Italia, Nium, Fulvium, Consulum subito ad gressus cum octo milibus hominum interfecit. Okay, so just as you're, you're thinking things are going well, Eutropius is, is really good at, at kind of um, shaping the narrative here. So things are going really great. And then he says, oh, by the way, Hannibal, right, Hannibal, in Italy, he suddenly, right, subito, 
um, suddenly attacking ad gressos. It's, it's a perfect passive participle referring back to Hannibal. So suddenly attacking the consul Nius Fulvius, right? Nium Fulvium Consulum. So suddenly attacking him, he interfaked, he killed him, right? So with this sudden attack, he interfaked, he killed the consul with 8,000 men right? Literally eight thousands of men. So this is a reference again to what's called um, the Battle of Herdonia. I believe the second Battle of Herdonia, again, 210 BCE. So right around the same time as Agrigentum and and Sicily and Syracuse, um, Hannibal just does a a surprise attack and he actually ends up killing another consul, which he's done several times now over the the 10 years. Okay. So it's another uh, interesting twist in the narrative where Eutropius is kind of showing how things are going really well in one spot and really badly in others. And just when you think things are going really well for the Romans and Sicily's great, he gives you that reminder of Hannibal is still out there in Italy. He's still very deadly and excellent uh, commander, and he's still causing havoc or wreaking havoc on the Romans. Okay. So chapter 14 has a lot of up and, uh, ups and downs, a lot of different references. We're playing around with the timeline a little bit and kind of jumping different events in a particular order, even though they didn't happen at the same time or maybe didn't happen quite in the way Eutropius is portraying it in this timeline. But this gives you an idea of his rhetoric, right? His theme is always sort of that the Romans can overcome anything, no matter how bad it looks. So he's playing with that when he says, oh, things are great over here, but horrible over here. And just when you think things are horrible, something good happens. And just when you think things are going great, something horrible happens. It's sort of that up and down in the narrative that really makes uh, his his story um, and his history interesting to read because um, it has a lot of like twists and turns as you go. But again, you're, you're, you're seeing that he's building to this idea that good things are going to happen and the Romans will overcome, even though it looks bleak, particularly in Spain. You're, you're going to see how he sets this up for sort of the rise of one of the most famous Romans, uh, Roman generals in their history, particularly in the Republic, which is Scipio Africanus. So see how he plays in. So hopefully this video may Made some sense and the translation was pretty good. If you have any questions at all, feel free to put a comment in the, in the uh, you know, put a comment below and I'll be happy to help you. But otherwise, just keep reading it, keep practicing it. Um, start with the vocab, look at a commentary if you can find one, um, you know, and just kind of work your way through it and you should be in a pretty good place, right? Um, and hopefully you're enjoying it, right? This is where we're getting into some really famous events of the Second Punic War and it is a really good story. So hopefully you found this enjoyable as you go too. But again, if you need anything, let me know. Otherwise, good luck with it.